Hi, SMI team. This is Lisa Homan. Hi, SMI. This is Donna Drummond. Greetings, SMI teammates. Matt Catizzo here. Hello, everyone. This is Kyle. Greetings, SMI members. This is Laura Latham. Hello, SMI members. I am so excited to see everyone again in person. This is Marisa Fairbaugh. I hope to see you very soon. And I couldn't be more proud to be a part of such an extraordinary organization and industry over the past two years as we have faced the pandemic together. Our industry is experiencing unprecedented impact on our global supply chain, ranging from raw material constraints and logistics and transportation headwinds to record demand for PPE and ongoing labor shortages for products made in the Americas. Our experiences these past two years have validated more than ever the importance of the relationship between providers and suppliers. Together, we support our clinicians and patients. It was through and with the discussion with so many of you during that time that we made it through. It was knowing that we weren't alone. It was knowing that I could call someone, talk, and network, problem solve, think about things a new way, and listen to the great ideas that all of you had. I'm so looking forward to being able to once again be together in person, nurturing the community that makes SMI so special. The open sharing of challenges, exchange of ideas, and collaborative spirit between our members is what makes SMI so special. And it's more important now than ever as our industry embraces this time of transformation. We learned so much over the last couple of years, and I'm so looking forward to working through the challenges and making our supply chain better together, because SMI is the perfect place to do it. I'm just excited that we are coming back together in person, that we're going to see each other again, because we are battle buddies and we've all been through this time now together. I welcome you, I welcome you to SMI with so much gratitude and so much excitement. Hello, I'm Nancy Anderson, Associate Executive Director of SMI. The SMI team and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, kicking off our winter virtual programs. And we'd like to thank our wonderful panel for being a part of the discussion today. We have a great session planned for you. Eric O'Daffer from Gartner will be facilitating a discussion on key issues that healthcare providers are considering as they plan for the future. Our panelists are Jim Francis from Mayo, Marisa Farabaugh from Advent Health, Mary Beth Lang from Kaiser, and Paul Creter from Deloitte. I know we're all looking forward to hearing from their unique and varied insights. We will have time for questions at the end of today's webinar. All participants are on mute, and you can submit your questions via the Q&A or chat feature for us to share with the panelists at the end. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Eric and the panel. Thank you, Nancy, and welcome everyone. I'm really excited to have you all here. Uh, today, we, we've got a tremendous panel discussion uh, for Healthcare Supply Chain 2027, four leaders' perspectives on the next five years. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just have to say uh, that I can't wait to be in person with everybody. Uh, but for today, uh, I think we've got this, this great panel and we get to talk about these four main topics. Uh, and they're really going to be, uh, you know, creating a mission-driven supply chain, thinking about collaboration 2.0, thinking about uh, aligning supply chain to the digital front door uh, in healthcare. Uh, and lastly, uh, aligning supply chain to home healthcare. Um, we've got these leaders that are gonna be able to share this. We really have an amazing panel today, uh, an all-star group, uh, if you will. And this isn't advancing, but now it is. Uh, so uh, welcome uh, today uh, to Mary Beth Lang, Chief Pharmacy Officer uh, at uh, Kaiser Permanente, uh, was Chief Supply Chain Officer, now Chief Pharmacy Officer. Marisa Farabaugh, Chief Supply Chain Officer at Advent Health. Jim Francis, uh, Chair of Supply Chain Management at Mayo Clinic. And last but not least, Paul Creter, Principal uh, Healthcare Supply Chain at Deloitte. Welcome to all the panelists. So, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have some ground rules. Uh, we're gonna move uh, through our topics uh, and give people time. We've got about 45 minutes. Uh, we'll, as Nancy mentioned, we'll take questions at the end uh, from the audience, uh, but uh, we're, we're really just gonna kind of get, get things kicked off. And some of these questions are gonna be long form. Some of them are gonna be what I call a speed round where we can kind of give short answers uh, to a, a very succinct question. We'll hopefully have a little fun on the way, uh, 
And if we have time, we'll give people a chance to recap um, things. But let's get this kicked off uh, with uh, mission-driven supply chain. Um, and Gartner has a has a model for everything. Uh, they have a model here. Um, you know, and if you really think about what's happened through the pandemic, uh, we went from having challenges with su supplies, but in the Omicron and Delta variant, uh, primary issue was was staffing. Um, and if you think about this, it wasn't just in healthcare, but it hit healthcare hard. Uh, but in every industry, uh, staffing and supply chain and how you thought about it, uh, you know, became an issue. Um, you know, healthcare has an advantage here in what we do. It's one that maybe we haven't taken as full advantage as we should have, uh, but we have lots of issues around uh, compensation, uh, traditional, you know, kind of legacy compensation. We got an issue or we maybe haven't accelerated and thought about our mission um, leveling challenges and then just the great resignation that as I talk to systems across the country, it impacts everybody. Um, every All industries, though, are trying to tackle this uh, and, you know, kind of drive toward this purpose outcome in, in whatever industry that they're doing. The stakeholders are different. Uh, but this concept of kind of creating a purpose and, and, and driving toward that is uh, uh, is pretty key. So first panelist question, and Marisa, it's going to come to you, uh, which is, you know, hey, what is a mission-driven uh, supply chain uh, in healthcare? Uh, and and kind of how are you thinking about it at your organization? Sure, thanks, Eric. And thanks for the opportunity to join um, my colleagues here uh, for this for this time together. Um, you know, it's a great question. I think that for Advent Health, um, we have we have a strong mission at the core. So in general, so for me, when I hear the term mission, um, you know, our mission in everything that we do through Advent Health is related to extending the healing ministry of Christ. But I think your question, you know, is how does that mission relate to supply chain, and how are we growing the mission, you know, of healthcare supply chain? Um, especially as it relates post-COVID. Um, you know, for us, we are really focused on how, how and where we integrate in with our clinical partners, um, making sure that we're working in a relevant way, making sure we've got the data to support what we're doing. Um, I think also it's a lot of focus around the people, the people that we've got, how they can connect in with what it is that we're doing um, within healthcare at the broad level, and then more specifically within supply chain. It's been so exciting post COVID to have so much energy and excitement about joining supply chain as a career path in the future um, for folks. And I think that it's um, a time for us to really embrace and tie uh, new folks who wanna enter into our space to you know, a broader, a broader base of helping others. Um, I think it's also really special being in supply chain uh, in healthcare because healthcare is such is, is usually very um, connected towards how can I give back? How do I give back in my community? How can I do things for others? And in supply chain, it's a space where you didn't necessarily have to go to school as a clinical person. Um, but you're joining and participating and supporting all of that activity, um, you know, and with the need for folks to be in this space, really growing and 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 uh, and improving it. So for us, it's about connecting a lot of dots uh, this year, post COVID, and really, you know, really exciting time to be in supply chain. Yeah, great. Thanks, Marisa and, and Mary Beth. What is it? What does it mean? How are you doing things at, at, at Kaiser to uh, to align to the younger workers that are that are seeking meaning in in today's world? Yeah. So when when we think about the mission, uh, many uh, of my peers join Kaiser Permanente because of the mission. And what we are finding in supply chain is there are many ways to connect uh, our mission to our supply chain decisions. Uh, and we do that uh, one example through our impact spending uh, group where we are able to make sure our spending decisions are environmentally sound, economically viable and socially equitable. And many of our younger uh, staff members are really relating to the mission of supply chain and how we help our supplier partners, how we look at diverse spend and not only counting the spend but making the spend count. Uh, we were part of 12 um, health systems that created the impact purchasing commitment. And uh, we've, we've seen a lot of support from our newer 
staff members to, to really get on board with how we can expand our diverse spend, our sustainability, and then economic growth uh, through job creation. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Jim, how about how about you guys? How's it how's it going there? Are you having having the same challenges? Are you making some breakthroughs at Mayo Clinic? Well, I think we're all experiencing very similar challenges, Eric, and it is good to be with you and the other panelists, as Marissa mentioned uh, today. Much like Mary Beth mentioned, um, many people join Mayo Clinic because of the mission of the organization and their ability to contribute to uh, clinical practice, education, and research at Mayo Clinic. When I think about a purpose-driven supply chain, um, to me, it really relates to how well your supply chain strategy um, supports the mission, overall mission and values of the organization. And it's the primary reason for that is because the, it, it basically serves as the basis for all planning and implementation that's done in supply chain. And if it's done well, if you align well and you execute well, um, you know, supply chain is going to help create that culture of purpose as you have here on your document uh, for young professionals to um, engage with. And if you talk to them nowadays, um, they're really interested in figuring out where they can work, where they can help contribute, where they can help make a difference, where they have meaning. Uh, and I believe a well-articulated purpose-driven supply chain mission that's aligned with your organizational mission helps create that culture that they're looking for. Yeah, specific, just following up on that, Jim, is there are there things that you're doing as part of your strategic planning uh, or your communications uh, strategy out to the out to the group and the organization that highlights supply chain as a as a special mission-driven place in the organization? Yeah, well, I, as I think it's already been mentioned too, um, we've seen over the last two plus years, um, how important front and center supply chain has become. Um, you know, while the circumstances have been difficult for us as an industry, as a profession, I think it's naturally attracted people to it too. And they're learning more about supply chain. We have more people expressing interest in it as a career. Um, and I think, you know, well, it's, it's maybe one of the more positive things that have come out of the pandemic. Paul, what about you and your role? You're seeing the whole uh, the whole country, uh, lots of different health systems, and also, you know, coming at it from an angle not as a provider, but as someone who's providing services to a provider. Uh, how's that? How's that working at Deloitte? Yeah, Eric, um, from a uh, entry level uh, staff and and getting um, folks interested in supply chain and excited about supply chain. Uh, one concept that we've started to put in place at some of our clients is the creation of an analyst pool concept. And so instead of um, those entry-level jobs being assigned to a specific function within supply chain, uh, we've created a pool and we have rotational assignments uh, that are run about every six months. And what that does with this um, new generation coming out is it, it allows them to be uh, more interested in their jobs. It gives them that, that sense of uh, new discovery and uh, engagement. And so they tend to like it better. And the good news about that is it improves retention rates and reduces um, attrition. Uh, and so that is an important, important thing because as organizations invest time in these staff, um, you don't want to see them you know, leave after a year and, and all that time kind of goes out the window. Yeah, I always say, how do you capture their hearts, uh, you know, and make this a place where they think they can, people, people, not they, but people can make a career of it and, and you know, feel good at it uh, from a leadership standpoint. So maybe well, a speed round here uh, early, you know, but what are, so to that end, right, we all have our own groups that we're trying to support, you know, are there one or two things uh, that either we can do as an industry or a group like SMI can help us to elevate the profession and, you know, create this as a, as a destination place to, to have a, a career that's mission driven. Uh, maybe Marisa, back to you on that one. speed round answer. Sure. Um, well, I would say, you know, if we're talking about promoting it as a career path, I think having the 
leadership involvement within supply chain involved in this, you know, that really will drive a focus towards it. I also think, um, you know, you need, we need to really look back in our pipelines and look at, you know, look at our, look at our higher education partnerships, you know, and really, you know, drive interest starting, starting there. Um, and then I think, you know, around succession planning and really how do you create a lighted career path within supply chain um, already for the current members that are on our team. So I think it's discipline and focus there. Yeah, I love it. Lighted career path. Mary Beth, how about you? One, two things? Yeah, I, I was too focused on the, the higher education, promoting summer internships and shadow opportunities, um, but also looking at our, our entry level positions, making sure that the qualifications are truly entry level. And then working with uh, HR to, to have a career matrix that considers promotion or recognitions at a cadence, a cadence to keep the uh, staff early in their career uh, viable within your organization. So it could be half steps, it could be other, other ways to, to do that recognition. Paul, on your end, things that you're seeing, one or two things. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, there aren't too many things uh, positive that came out of uh, the pandemic, uh, but one of them, I believe, is kind of like a, an upgrade uh, to the profile of supply chain. Um, my mother uh, said to me um, during the pandemic that she finally understood what I do for a living. And as satisfying as that was, I'm wondering what she thought I was doing for the last 26 <laughs> years. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I would echo the comments around uh, higher education and perhaps SMI could consider offering uh, student memberships uh, to um, some of the supply chain programs. There's been a significant proliferation of new supply chain programs in the last five years, some of which actually are have a concentration in terms of healthcare. So giving those uh, students the opportunity to uh, maybe listen in on some of the, the dialogue um, that goes on in SMI, I think that would just um, excite them even further. Great, thanks. Jim, cleanup thoughts on this one? You know, one thing I would say we're spending a fair amount of time at Mayo Clinic on is figuring out um, what are the desired skill sets that we're gonna need in the future to work in supply chain management. And in fact, uh, you know, every area uh, within the organization. So we need to identify what those desired skill sets are. We need to figure out how to offer those skill sets, uh, not only to our existing people that are longer term employees in supply chain management, but also figure out, you know, how to identify potential candidates that are coming into the field that has those desired skill sets to start with out at the gate. I would say that everything that we probably learned uh, or thought we knew about um, the recruitment and development retention of people was turned upside down because of COVID. Uh, you think about it today, you know, we're, we're competing for talent because they can work virtually and work anywhere. Uh, that didn't exist. We've had staff shortages. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a very different ball game today. Yeah. Well, those are great comments, uh, you know, lighted pathway, communication, tying it to strategy, mission-driven connection to people, uh, specifically young people that are coming through. I really think we got a great opportunity and thanks for all your thoughts on that. So we're gonna to toggle now to collaboration. Uh, as part of the Gartner Supply Chain, uh, Healthcare Supply Chain Top 25 this year, we ask uh, all the peer voters to identify who were collaborative partners. Um, and we've all been parts of panels that have talked about collaboration and, you know, how can we get it uh, and advance this. It was really interesting, though, to start to see the comments that came through the pandemic of, you know, why people valued these companies uh, as, as partners. You know, things, certainly the pandemic was front and center, uh, but engagement and value and solutions. Uh, you know, these partners that listen, it was really encouraging. We had 78 companies that got represented uh, in the uh, uh, in. In, in that process, uh, and it was really great. But I guess, you know, coming through the pandemic, thinking about kind of collaboration 2.0 and what, what it looks like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna first do a kind of a speed round. Uh, and I wanna say collaboration with suppliers uh, and service providers versus five years ago. So think back five years ago, 
Is it better, thumbs up, same, or thumbs down, worse? Everybody make sure you get your thumb in the air and uh, uh, go better, same, thumbs down. Uh, that's a, okay, so that was that was uh, three enthusiastic thumbs up and one, I guess I'll give Mary Beth a, an enthusiastic uh, tentative thumbs up. Um, so Mary Beth, maybe with that, what, what makes it uh, a tentative thumbs up on your side? I think the pandemic really showed us what we need from a collaboration uh, versus what we might have been seeking prior to the pandemic. Uh, so as we looked at being able to to do near time decision making, uh, solutioning, innovative strategies, partners uh, emerged that um, might not have been on our radar. Uh, and others that we've had long tenured relationships with weren't as strong uh, through the pandemic, depending on their capabilities. So uh, I, I think we've had some breakthrough uh, collaborations and, and uh, we have found a way to make more nimble our nimbler decisions uh, and that uh, agile decision making, if you will, will stay with us post pandemic. Uh, and, and I think we will look for different attributes of collaboration than we did prior to the pandemic. That's why I was a little, it's, it's up and down for me. Well, you see it across the country. What's, what's your, you were first thumb up that I saw up. Why, uh, why enthusiasm? Yeah, um, well, I will build off of uh, what Mary Beth said a little bit, and I think that um, a unique uh, change in the healthcare supply chain during COVID was that we saw health systems um, be forced into uh, basically going through uh, more direct to the manufacturer from a global perspective. And as such, I think that that is going to continue and maybe even get a little larger, and what that uh, necessitates is uh, to collaboration with uh, from a partner perspective for things like import export laws, uh, customs, um, and and then global logistics and being able to um, facilitate those uh, transactions. So that's um, what we're kind of seeing uh, moving forward. Great, Jim. How about you? I, I say collaboration 2.0. Um, you know, and in, in my mind, a lot of that has to do with kind of clinical pathway alignment and even beyond kind of operational. Are you starting to see that uh, or are you making progress mostly on the operational side? What's the what's the state for you? You were a thumbs up. Yeah, I, I was a thumbs up, Eric. And yes, I do believe we are making progress. And, and I don't think um, given the pandemic experience that we've had, there's ever been a more important time for us to collaborate, not only internally within our organization, but also externally to our organization. We're probably working closer with our clinical practice and our diagnostic areas than we ever have um, over the last two plus years. And I think that's all been very positive to demonstrate what you're capable of when you work together and collaborate. You know, and, and I think it's just human nature sometimes for us to look to blame somebody for the challenges that we all experienced in supply chain. Uh, but I have a hard time saying that it's all the manufacturer's fault or all the distributor's fault and so forth, because we all faced something that none of us were prepared for. Uh, what I have found uh, increasingly so, so is that, um, you know, it, it really comes down to how well you're communicating back and forth. And if you have uh, the right kind of relationships um, developed where you can have free flowing communication. We found throughout the pandemic that if we're notified sufficiently and, and, and have adequate time um, to be able to work something, um, we can usually mitigate a potential risk to the organization or an interruption in patient care. And that's been our focus. Um, and it's, I know it's a very basic thing to say, but I think it's increasingly about communication. At some point in the future, you know, we'll have technology that helps us sufficiently with this problem. But today it's still word of mouth. Risa, uh, comments from you, thoughts on you, from you? My colleagues have said it very well. Uh, you know, I agree with Mary Beth's comments to open and Jim's comments specifically around you know our uh, our lab partners that we've 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 grown to, you know, be 
very integrated with. You know, I think my thumbs up came from the fact that, you know, throughout COVID, there were relationships that just got doubled down on, you know, and it was that those relationships where I, I've used this term before, where we just had battle buddies, we went through it together. And so I think where those have occurred, um, it's those, those strategic partnerships and communication is, is so much further along and so much different than it was five years ago because we've been through it together and we've gotten out, we've gotten out of it together. So um, I, I think, uh, I think we are in a new space and we're going to continue to continue to move on that path forward. Yeah. And, and then maybe staying with you, Marisa. So, you know, SMI uh, is the, the home of collaboration, right? Tom Hughes and the collaboration award. Um, you know, that that's what a lot of this is about. One of the Gartner things that's come out is in, in supply chain ecosystems uh, across all industries, uh, they're talking about closing the say versus do gap. Um, uh, and uh, that's been a, a key thing. What is there things that you're seeing at your organization, um, you know, Marisa and then Paul, uh, that you think are specifically, and maybe this will be a speed round too, short things that you're doing to close that say do gap when it comes to collaboration? Sure. So very quickly, I think the alignment with our executive leadership here at Advent, along with our clinical colleagues, is really important because it's only through that that we understand the issues that we're really trying to solve for. And when we understand what we're trying to solve for, then we can work with our strategic partners and understand what they have to offer in that space. The miss is when we might be solving for something on supply chain side, and there's another issue that we're trying to solve for clinically or at the executive level. So we need to have clear alignment. The second thing that we're doing is a lot of engagement with at the C-suite level with our CEO. So we were very fortunate to have a very engaged uh, CEO, our CFO, who enjoy meeting with other CEOs and, and collaborating there. So, you know, as we think about how different collaborations work in the future, um, the transparency around what we're trying to solve for, I think, leads to the do part of that equation. Well, maybe one, are there, is there a, any project stuff that's coming out that organizations are saying, hey, help us do this? Or are you seeing this uh, anywhere in the country that goes, hey, manufacturer to provider collaborations on the rise, uh, you know, and closing that save versus do gap? Yeah, um, I would say that uh, there is a, an interest in doing that. Um, the, and it's primarily driven um, on the medical device uh, pharmaceutical side. Uh, at least uh, within Deloitte. Um, the, the challenge has been though in the last year or two uh, that that collaboration and those um, you know, unique business models have um, not been, we haven't been successful in getting them to a win, as much of a win-win scenario as we would like to see. Um, you know, they tend to be a little bit more geared um, towards the manufacturer. And so I think a critical thing moving forward is going to be uh, building off of the trust that was built during COVID and the battle buddy concept that Marissa uh, mentioned. And um, you know, coming to a more win-win uh, scenario in those collaborations. How about you, Mary Beth? I think what we're seeing is, is a lot more transparency transparency of where we are in the process. So internally being able to pull together a cross-functional team uh, to look at any care changes that have to happen at the same time as uh, severe supply shortages. Uh, we too have the, the benefit of having very engaged um, leaders uh, at our CEO and our COO, CFO um, positions, which is very helpful. And then from a supplier perspective, that transparency helps us to see not only our supply chain, but a, a view into their supply chain uh, so that we do better demand planning and, and um, more uh, transparent procurement. Uh, and that has been very helpful uh, to, to be able to, to look at our current situation, but also start planning for the future. Demand planning, early stages uh, for, for most. So glad to hear you guys are making progress on it. Jim, any, any thoughts for you? One or two things that are closing the gap versus on say versus do in this critical space? Yeah. Um, the thing I would probably add to what my 
my peers here have, have indicated at their shops, um, because it's certainly true at Mayo too, uh, you really have to have a very agile supply chain team. Uh, we're working somewhere around seven to 8,000 back orders a month currently uh, within Mayo Clinic. I'm sure the same is true for my colleagues. Um, you know, you have to have a team that's agile enough and flexible, nimble enough, whatever words you want to use, that can redirect um, on short notice nowadays, because we never know day to day what the next new supply chain disruption is going to be, and begin working that back order, understanding the criticality of the product, where it's used across our system, what alternatives or substitutes we may have in place. You know, they're the backbone that's really carrying uh, a lot of the burden here right now. Great. Well, thanks for everybody for those, those thoughts. Going to continue to be a core focus in, uh, uh, in that. Okay, so next topic, uh, the digital uh, aligning supply chain uh, to the digital front door uh, for healthcare. So Mary Beth, this was your topic. There were some questions from the SMI members that said, hey, please clarify what this means up front. So I'm putting you right on the spot. Uh, to clarify with uh, with what you mean uh, by aligning uh, supply chain to the digital front door of healthcare. Yeah, so I'll give a few examples first, and then I'll uh, share what we're trying to do. So when when we looked at the pandemic and the immediate reaction of trying to uh, move a lot of our care virtually, uh, we we knew we knew we needed to look at the end to end process of delivering care. And so uh, if you look at the example of a virtual visit and there's a prescription that goes along with a virtual visit, uh, in our old process, we would have asked our member to go to an outpatient pharmacy, uh, request mail order. Uh, but in the pandemic, in about two weeks, we had stood up our, our total logistics uh, solution so that we could deliver within two hours. We could do same day, next day, uh, and really add then uh, an entire end-to-end -end virtual experience uh, so that's one example. Another example was in um, prenatal care. Um, many of our mothers-to-be did not want to come into an office. So we had to think through, how do we do that monitoring and how do we do it remotely? Um, so we sent a scale home. We, uh, we provided blood pressure, uh, cuffs, or an app, depending on the patient, uh, and started to move that into a more virtual care uh, environment so that we could do a virtual visit and do some of the checks um, so that we we could supplement uh, in in office care. Um, so a few examples of, of what do we mean by virtual care. Um, when we look at our digital front door at KP, we're really redesigning the care model. And so when we think of digital first as a system, we want to make care convenient and easy for every member to get care and service that they need uh, where they want it, where they want to consume it every time. Uh, we want to focus on delivering superior quality and drive equitable health outcomes for our members and improve conditions for health within our communities. And last, we want to recognize that the redesign of the care model uh, is also going to require us to redesign our cost model um, so that we have a cost structure that's affordable to support all of this care delivery. So those are just examples of what we mean by a digital front door. Uh, and, and we're not alone. If you, if you saw the news uh, uh, recently, Amazon announced that they're rolling into uh, tele, telehealth uh, services nationwide. They're really focused on primary care services. Uh, and so they're, they're really expanding uh, not only their inpatient or in-person in um, care from eight cities to 20, but they're really looking to expand their virtual uh, along with their in-person. So we're seeing many new uh, entries into the market. It's becoming a crowded market. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to say, how do we redesign our front door uh, in a digital first strategy? Well, that's great. Those are great examples and a great way to bring it to life. Uh, again, Gertner's back to these models. And I always look at this as an IT dominant model to think digital first and how that's aligning. And I, tr I try to always talk about it and say, okay, well, where does supply chain fit in? Are we on this model uh, and not just buried somewhere on it? Uh, you know, when you think about this digital front door and I know this thing's busy, but you know, and, and the path that, that patient care goes on, you know, I'd say here, maybe under medical device integration, 
uh, we're here under medication management, adherence to medication, uh, you know, but for many, I talk to IDNs all the time, health systems um, and, and manufacturers for that matter, uh, you know, there's there's a focus, particularly at the health system level, that is kind of like, well, I'm not sure how we get paid for that. That looks like an additional cost. Uh, it's changing for sure, uh, but there's a whole maturity curve that, that goes around this. Um, you know, and you're right, Amazon, CVS, Walgreens are carving out that space from hospital to home. Um, you know, and you can orchestrate partners or you can build it yourself. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess that those are just kind of interesting things to think about and go, where, where does supply chain fit on the model? Where can we intersect? Uh, and to that extent, Jim, as you think about it, right, you've had a digital supply chain officer now for three, four years. How's that? How's that going? And where's Mayo on this uh, on this digital first digital front door and, and supply chain alignment to it? Yeah, I'd say much like Kaiser and probably other providers, uh, Advent Health, um, you know, we're, we're making a fairly significant investment in digital health um, across our system. And I, I think this, again, is another outcome from COVID that really kind of forced us into virtual care, uh, probably before most of us were ready to embark on our digital strategies. But uh, another investment that Kaiser and, and Mayo Clinic have made is in medically home. Um, and uh, given some of the uh, examples that Mary Beth used, you know, medical device integration, uh, which obviously is a big component of supply chain contracting for such devices and relationships of service providers, will be part of that, uh, where you physically care for people in their home and monitor them remotely. Um, so that's just one component uh, of it. But I would also tell you that um, as a supply chain, we have to be adaptable uh, to various components, digital health being one of them, or other components of the continuum of care and be able to figure out where we can help provide support and service to take care of patients. And that's a key part of it. You mentioned that I do have a digital officer. I, I do. I actually have a team of people that are working on our digital supply chain strategy. And uh, I'd already talked a little bit about Agile, and they are Agile uh, because they have other duties and responsibilities as they're helping outline and uh, implement our digital supply chain, which is taking uh, years of systems that really probably weren't optimally con uh, converged. And now we're converging them into an information management platform where we can optimize all the processes as one system. So that works underway right now too. Great, thanks. Marisa, how about you? How, is, how, how are you thinking about this at Advent Health? Well, you know, at the sake of not sounding repetitive, you know, there's, there's, cause there's so much that, that was just mentioned there where we are, we are on that same journey for, um, you know, when we think about where investments at Advent Health have been made on the digital side, you know, creative to what we've just talked about, you know, we've also got a virtual cockpit that we're, you know, where we're trying to really um, see what can be done virtually and remotely from a centralized uh, space clinically uh, from that standpoint. And so right now we're doing radiology work there and Im imaging work there. So how, you know, how does that grow? How does that grow throughout our system? Um, so that's a, that's a big place where, where there's some focus again, in addition to what's already been mentioned. Um, but I think, I think Jim just, you know, said it very well for us. We're just, we're on, we're on a journey right now to really figure out what are what is the current state of all of our systems with regards to supply chain and map out the interconnectivity within them and then map out future state and where we're where we need to go and this is not something that's going to happen overnight it is hard work it is heavy lifting it is really hard to sit down and talk about this stuff but this is the type of work that's going to be there in years to come and and have you know, have hopefully been well thought through and, and be the foundation for platforms that will grow digitally to be able to feed from. So there's a lot of focus and work going on here. Before we go to Paul, maybe back to the free providers for just a second. I, I struggle with this balance of, hey, it looks like an additional cost. Is it a revenue opportunity? Are we measuring the impact of, of uh, you know, the quality of care? Do any of you have a sense for 
you know, as you expand these, right, there's a cost to it or an opportunity to it that has to have an ROI. How, are, are you far enough along to, to be able to say how your organizations are thinking about that yet? Yeah, it's certainly a key topic at Mayo Clinic. I can tell you um, most of those metrics you just mentioned are being monitored. Um, I would tell you that there's probably more questions than there are answers at this stage, Eric, and, and the jury's yeah. out of whether or not, um, you know, it's more cost effective, it's um, got adequate reimbursement, uh, those types of things that you normally are concerned with in operating um, a new service such as this. Yeah, I, I would also add, you know, if we are tied to bricks and mortars, you're going to be difficult to to delight the customer and, and look at the customer experience over time. And so new entrants into the market uh, may be able to get there uh, more quickly. And so we're looking at uh, not only the cost of the change, but also uh, the cost of doing nothing. Uh, what, what will happen if, if we don't make the investment and, and stay the course? Uh, we, we, will, we will lose a lot of ground uh, and so we're, we're trying to balance all, a lot of those decisions. Yeah, and, and I would just add, you know, because I think it's sometimes a little different from the provider side where we are constantly competing for capital with major, you know, major other areas, whether it's on the clinical side, on the IT front. It's a little different than our colleagues on the supplier provider or uh, partner side where their, their core, core work is to create that supply, that, that item. And so the investments in making that are there on the supply chain. I think coming out of COVID though, there was such a illumination of where there needs to be capital investments in the supply chain side. And so while the ROI and the, it, it is incredibly important, I also think that there's leadership now outside of supply chain at the executive level that recognize some of this is just foundational stuff that needs to get investments made into. Oh, that's a great point. All right, Paul, you've been patient on this one, uh, but I'm really interested in how you sit uh, and, and where you sit, because you're, you guys are doing work uh, across not only supply chain, but the care side. Are you seeing a convergence here? Um, you know, and it, is, the, is the demand for this uh, at the mature systems and the immature? What's, what's happening uh, in this space? Yeah, well, first off, um, we're seeing a lot of inspiration come from outside industry, uh, manufacturers, uh, retail, um, and even transportation, airlines, uh, and rail. Um, and, and so it's a really exciting space because there's a plethora of digital technologies uh, that, that can solve uh, business problems within healthcare. So uh, home care always takes, uh, always gets truncated. Uh, we're, we're almost at time. And uh, I think what we're gonna do is maybe hold that one. We've touched on it. Uh, you know, I think it's a, a growing important area of importance um, you know, digital front door and the way that we think about, uh, you know, the non-acute experience. But uh, I think for us to give that topic enough, enough time, uh, maybe we hold it for uh, another day or an SMI to use session. Um, so uh, I want to give each panelist a chance to, in a couple sentences, uh, to summarize or share anything else that they're thinking uh, around any one of these three areas or just anything else uh, that you feel like it would be important to share with the SMI audience today. Uh, you know, we covered collaboration, we covered the digital front door and aligning supply chain, um, you know, uh, and we, uh, you know, we, we, we covered another topic. You know, I'm forgetting what our first topic was. It's been too, uh, too long, but the, um, if you have any parting thoughts, what was it, Jim? Mission driven. Mission driven. Yes. I got to get that beaten into my head. Mission driven supply chain. Uh, so Jim, maybe you uh, uh, give us wrap comments and uh, we'll go around the horn and then uh, close this out. Uh, be happy to, Eric. Um, you know, I, I would tell you that um, the last two years have probably been the most challenging in my professional career. Uh, and I think certainly for supply chain management as a profession uh, across our industry, uh, we've learned a lot. Um, we've had to be very nimble. Um, I think the opportunities here, given some of the activities that we've been kind of catapulted into, to fundamentally transform our supply chain. And I think all of us have to take advantage of that. 
Um, as we move forward, you know, we're, we were talking about something that has to be more resilient, has to be more agile, has to be digitally empowered, and, um, you know, it has to be able to demonstrate value uh, for the organization increasingly across many, many areas of uh, the healthcare continuum. And uh, that's what we're focused on. Great. Thanks, Jim. Marisa? You know, we would, I would add to the list that we just went over, resiliency is a big one for us. You know, uh, we've spent a lot of time even defining that. And I think there's going to be so much focus in the future around that. Um, you know, in terms of ESG, environmental social governance, that's going to be another place where I think we're going to have a huge role to play in there in the future, uh, particularly around scope three. Um, so I think that's going to be another big, big item. So we're those two areas are going to also be our focus. And, and I think through that, you know, if we get there, we, we will be working with our battle buddies. We will be side by side. I think that through all of that will drive um, additional strategic partnerships, which will always be a focus of ours as well. well. Yeah, I think that if I had to sum it up in a word, it's, it's disruption. And so if you look back uh, in time, there were, points in time where a given industry or sector had an event that um, caused disruption uh, in general to that space. And I think uh, COVID was that black swan event for healthcare um, that in essence is going to create disruption uh, from the status quo additional uh, historical supply chain. And three areas that I think are going to be impacted. Uh, number one, uh, global business relationships. So in the past, uh, health systems really did not, um, with one or two exceptions, um, interact directly with global suppliers. And I think that is going to change and change for the, uh, the positive. Um, I think that uh, opportunities as a result of that to do direct contracting uh, are going to be uh, big and could have an impact on the GPO space. And then lastly, um, having to move uh, those products and supplies um, from internationally to uh, local domestic uh, United States, it's going to require uh, you know that unique skill set of import export uh, logistics uh, and being able to successfully move that uh, stuff in without getting hung up in customs. Great. And Mary Beth, last but not least, bring us home on this one. I think we've seen through the pandemic that we have. Uh, elevated the importance of su supply chain. Uh, we have the the support of our executives to build out the the digital strategies and and the supply chain work that my peers have have uh, articulated. Uh, the need to make sure that our supply chains clinically integrated uh, is is more evident now than ever. Uh, and so I, I'm excited. I'm excited with the number of, of applicants and and new grads that are that are actually choosing healthcare. It's a very time. So, all right. I think you got stepped on a little bit there, Mary Beth. But I think you were ending with a, a positive, forward-looking guidance toward the mission-driven supply chain. So, with that. Uh, Thank you to SMI for the platform. Thank you to the panelists for all your great thoughts uh, around these three topics, mission-driven supply chain, collaboration, and aligning to the, the digital front door. I think this is hugely important stuff um, and really are looking forward now to taking some questions from the audience uh, and continuing this discussion uh, with all of you. Thanks for joining today uh, and uh, let's kick off to, uh, to questions. Thank you so much, Eric. We really appreciate your time today and the time of all the panelists. Um, great program, and we've got some excellent questions. So I'm just going to start um, lobbing some questions at our panelists if you all want to come back on. I think we've got all the panelists out there um, viewable. Um, but the first question that has been shared with us through the chat today is a question on um, the Agile methodology and wondering about recommendations on implementing and sustaining Agile method methodology throughout the supply chain. Um, Mary Beth, since you, I think, brought it up, um, maybe you can take that first. Yes, thank you. So uh, what we've seen on Agile is we've, we've adopted many of the 
the programs of daily huddles and uh, quick decision making, getting the right set of leaders into each discussion so that you can have a full discussion, make a decision and move on. Uh, and so we're seeing many of those traits continue uh, even for non-COVID related issues. Uh, so we're really excited about trying to, to move decisions along more quickly. Wonderful. Any of our other panelists have anything to add on um, sustaining agile methodology? Now, from my perspective, Nancy, I would tell you that um, uh, COVID's forced us to be agile. Um, and it might have been a natural progression from uh, our internal capabilities anyway, but uh, at Mayo, uh, the team has developed some agile methodologies and actually some training for staff. Um, if done well and, and you have great experience with it, what I would tell you is it actually just becomes part of your culture, your behavior. And I think we're going to need that kind of flexibility. At least we've learned that we need that flexibility and, and uh, we'll deploy it from here on out. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. Um, next question, just to keep the conversation going and uh, get to as many questions as we can, because we did get some great questions as people registered and then today as well. Um, a question more specifically on the labor crisis that we're all currently facing and wondering if the panelists can share any of the tactics or strategies they have seen that supply chain or they have themselves, you, the, you yourselves have implemented to help address the labor crisis that we're all facing right now. And Marisa, can you take that one first? Sure, thank you. I, I think we touched a little bit on it in terms of you know, creating pipelines for, for folks coming into supply chain. For us here, we are, we are really leaning in as a leadership team, um, first of all. So when we've got interested folks uh, in, in supply chain, residents, interns, et cetera, how do we create the experience for them so folks get excited, tell their friends, come back, come into supply chain. That actually works, by the way. People, people end up in our space from that standpoint. Um, you know, it's spending time. It's all spending time. You know, it's spending time connecting with higher education curriculums, doing papers with them, driving interest. You know, we're all competing for the same labor resources. So how do you drive interest in, in our space? And then once we've got people here, the focus has to be on creating you know, career ladders for them, doing succession planning and all that stuff is a lot of, it's oftentimes um, a lot to say, but not always times what we do. And I think we need to be very diligent. Think of ourselves as a strategic arm for the organization. Um, and then from that standpoint, you've got to manage strategically, you've got to manage, you know, labor, labor um, shortages too. So we're, we're taking some of those steps. Excellent. Um Mary Beth, Jim, or Paul, any thoughts on how supply chains are managing the labor crisis in healthcare? I'll just add one um, with our current staff. We are really intently showing gratitude. We're recognizing that they're fatigued. We're recognizing that if there are non-essential meetings that we should cancel them. Uh, we've tried to have meeting-free Friday afternoons so that folks can recharge and catch up. Uh, we're not always successful, but really recognizing that you know the staff is is fatigued after several years of of pandemic responses uh, we we need to think through that with them uh, and and try to be as um, understanding uh, for getting them to take time off uh, as possible I'd like Nancy, that Mary Beth mm -hmm. uh, one quick uh, quick comment um, some things that I've seen, uh, folks implement, which are pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so starting training programs that are actually teaching not only the, the role of that particular individual, but the role of the person behind that individual in the chain and in the process and the role in front of uh, such that when certain elements of a team would go down because of, um, you know, maybe a positive COVID test or, or a family member that tested positive, um, it just created a lot more uh, agility and, and nimbleness in being able to respond and move resources around within the functions. Yeah, great idea. Thanks, Paul. Um, in that same vein, we have a question related to virtual workers and how your organizations are all viewing 
the role of virtual workers going forward. We've obviously all been virtual for a long time through the pandemic, but some organizations are staying virtual, some orga organizations are going back to full time. So um, question on how you're viewing virtual work, uh, virtual workers going forward. Now from a Mayo Clinic standpoint, I'd say virtual workers are here to stay. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, in, in some regards it's helped us recruit people. Believe it or not, it's, it's difficult to recruit people to Rochester, Minnesota, especially this time of year. Um, so virtual workers are, um, um, are good from the standpoint that, um, you know, it, it enables you to, you know, be more creative when it comes to recruitment if you can have people work from anywhere. I'm hopeful that the pendulum shifts a little bit back um, as we see more light at the end of the tunnel and that we go back to some type of hybrid. But the people that are supply chain uh, staff today that are on site are those that are supporting clinical procedural areas and delivering supplies. Everybody else in, in Mayo supply chain management is virtual. It's a big change for you all. Marisa? Sure. Huh? I think Jim Jim might want to keep the floor for another second to respond to Regine's uh, <laughs> I know, I, saw that. <laughs> I didn't see um, it. Yeah, it's probably better, Jim. We'll just we'll just keep going. <laughs> uh, sure, we're hybrid at at Advent right now. Um, you know, I would say four out of five days, uh, folks are virtual, and then our office is coming back uh, one day a week in general. Obviously, at on site, you know, the needs are are different there, and folks need to be on site there. Um, our leadership team is on site much much more often than one day a week, and. You know, we're just we're just making it work. I think we have to be sensitive to how recruiting works, um, but there are a lot of meetings that are very beneficial to still connect with and create a culture of collaboration. Definitely. And Mary Beth, how's it looking at Kaiser these days in terms of virtual workers? Yeah, very much um, similar to what Jim mentioned. Virtual work is here to stay at, at KP, and we're working through. You know, how do we train managers to manage? virtual teams and how do we look at how to create connected communities of folks so they don't feel isolated when they're working remotely. Um, so a lot of, a lot of efforts uh, are put into now that um, aspect of, of how we will lead. It's a, it's a new world. Well, we're almost at the top of the hour. I wanna thank our wonderful panelists and thank Eric for um, facilitating a great discussion. Um, I know I got a lot of new insights today and really appreciated hearing your perspectives. We do have an evaluation survey. It is in the chat. So if you would, all of our participants would just click on that and provide their feedback. It really helps us as we um, plan future SMI webinars. And speaking of that, we do have several SMI programs coming up. We have our executive exchanges next week for the members who are, um, for our members. So please sign up if you've not done so. We will have our council meetings in March and look forward to having everyone who's registered for a council on those programs. And then in the end of March, at March 22nd, we will have our other bookend. We have our industry partner panel round table. So we hope you'll all join us for that program as well. Um, and the best news of all is that our spring forum registration will launch tomorrow. So watch your email and register for the spring forum. And we will look forward to seeing you in Orlando and to seeing you online for SMI programs between now and then. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day.